for the stardom, but this year we decided to start the year with him. So let me just present you one of the most renowned person I have ever known that works with this kind of um, project and this kind of design and who is passionate about it. So let me present you to my dearest friend. And since we're talking in English, I can say Alvaro <laughs> instead of Alvaro. But he names, his name is Alvaro and he's an architect. He's been working for us for a very, very, very long time. And he is uh, one, like I said, one of the nicest persons I know, but also he's very good at his, what, at what he does. His client is always pricing him on what he's doing and uh, like he's really like have helped us solve a lot of issues that we have not only with um, architecture but with other problems that we have in Better Pros. So I bring you today one of the masters of the people who can actually uh, teach us about music theaters and all that he does with uh, his entire career. So with no further ado, please everyone welcome to the stage the one and only Alvaro Paris, how he likes to say it. And I'm just kidding. Alvarito, I give you the mic so you can start enlightening us with your amazing um, session, so. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Yes? Yes, we can hear you uh, just fine. Thank you. Well, thank you, Santi. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, well, my name is Alvaro. Uh, I'm from Costa Rica. I'm uh, an architect. And I've been working in the theater and around the theater for a long time. And um, in Better Pros, I've been working with a very, very special client of us um, that uh, is uh, a theater consultant. So we've been developing this better session for you, the first one of uh, this year. Uh, so we can speak a little bit about uh, theater and what uh, we can do as architects and designers. So uh, we named the talk Designing Dreams, Building the Perfect Stage. So what um, I would like to, to share with you today is general knowledge, maybe a little bit of uh, vocabulary so you can identify um, what uh, the elements of theater are, what we can do, and um, what, um, what's the purpose of uh, design and stagecraft in um, for the for the theater and for performance arts. So um, I divided the talk in these four points, designing and performance, talking a little bit about everything we have, uh, a little bit of stage design and what stage designers do. Then we're moving towards the more technical aspects of um, theater consultants. Uh, who are they and what do they do? And uh, finally talk a little bit about theater design, uh, kit of parts and system definition. So um, if at any point anybody has any questions or comments, uh, we can make a stop and talk a little bit about it. Uh, if not, I can go all the way to the end of the presentation and we can talk then but uh, I'll be open. Uh, we are trying to um, speak in English. I think this is the first uh, better session in English. So uh, I encourage you to ask questions in English. And if you're not feeling comfortable, you can write them down in Spanish and uh, Sandy or Vicky can translate for everybody. So uh, let's go ahead. Let's talk about design and performance, first of all. So uh, first of all, what are the scenic arts? What are they? So uh, scenic arts is everything that has to do with uh, live performance. So we can talk about theater performances. We can talk about dance. We can talk about music performance. And I've heard over the, over the, the chat before that uh, people like opera. So opera is part of that, of those uh, scenic arts. We can also talk about circus arts and interactive and immersive performances as well. So uh, what are uh, uh, scenic arts? They are live performances. They are intentionally arranged, an intentional arrangement and design of the space according to the story or to a narrative. And they are designed to evoke emotion and engagement from the audience at every point. Uh, they are also, and that's very important, a social and collective event where people come together to experience a moment. So as designers, we have to take that into account, that people will be moving in and out of a performance and having um, different kinds of flows in the building or in the space that we are designing. So that's has, that has to be taken into consideration. So what is stage design? Well, stage design is a design based on an artistic vision. We, uh, as architects, uh, usually take 
uh, references to design, uh, the the needs of a client, uh, budgets, um, I don't know, a particular uh, need of a developer or something like that. Here we are basing our design on our artistic vision that comes from a, the director, from the screen uh, or script writer, um, from someone in the in the production. What are the elements uh, of design present in a live performance? Well, we have lots of them. We have scenery, lighting, sound, costume, props, projection, environmental um, design, all of those things. But instead of uh, talking about each one of these in particular, let me uh, give you a couple of examples of uh, theater performances that I particularly like and personally like, and we can talk about them uh, further. The first one is a production of Network. Network is based on a movie with the same name that the National Theater uh, put on um, on their stage uh, a couple of years ago. So this is an, a very interesting uh, production because it, mix, uh, it, it mixes um, li elements of live performance, also pre-recorded uh, performances, and live recording on site. So this is a mixture of those three elements that come together. The stage is designed as a, as a news set, uh, like a television newscast set, uh, with also a working bar. So people on the stage over here, you can see them, they are ordering drinks and having a little bit of fun while the performance is happening. So um, over here, there's another uh, picture where we can see elements, the, the three elements uh, combined. We have the over here, the live performance, over here, uh, the, the recording or the broadcast of that performance, and over here, the control booth of both the stage play and the actual production. So uh, people in the crew and performers are all mixed together um, to bring this um, very intense play to life. There's another uh, view of the same um, seen over here and another one over here let me show you a quick video of what that uh, entails and what those elements uh, working together start to entail sound osc house lights bump out yep one minute no, to go one minute to go Seconds and counting. Howard, where the hell is Howard? Good. Patty Hearst, the Middle East. Rush belt closures. Max. Okay. <laughs> Already there. Good. Give me a camera. Do we have sound? Check. Thirty seconds. B camera. Check. Printing out a fly one hundred. Howard. Check. Studio ready. Studio ready. Right, it's 12. Yep. Continuity. It's time for tonight with Howard Beale. Cue music and titles. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Camera. And Howard. Good evening. It is Friday, September 19th, and I'm Howard Beale. So that's a little bit of network over here. Um, so it's a, a very intense uh, play with a lot of working elements that has to have to be queued in at the perfect time in order for me, to make it like a seamless uh, broadcast as well as a seamless uh, play. Uh, the other um, example I have is The Crucible. This is another uh, uh, play, a uh, very classical play, uh, staged also by the National Theater. Uh, so this is based on the Salem Witch Trials. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with that story, but this is a period piece. So on this case, we're depending on uh, costume and the general props of the play to um, to show us that uh, period piece. So the, the the aging of the materials, the design of the of the um, of the furniture on stage, uh, that everything communicates the, the time of the play that we are uh, looking at. Um, it's also uh, with very intense religious themes. So as you can see on those on, on these kinds of staging, we see the, 
the arrangement of the space as well as, as the arrangement of the lights um, also have that uh, conceptual um, depth that is trying to, to convey to the audience. Uh, the other interesting element about this um, production is this uh, huge uh, square that is on top of the whole stage that makes um, rain. So we have lots and lots of knobs on the uh, on every element on every side of this um, rectangular element, and that brings uh, actual rain. So when people get on, uh, into the theater, it starts to rain, and they can feel the rain, and the rain can go um, uh, on and off in between scenes, and that makes it for a, a very big big. Um, element technical element and for the for the play is very interesting as well that's the view of the of the raining cube on the olivier theater and let me show you a quick video of how that works actually so we see the the knobs over here on these rails this is the designer of the stage this is s devling if you want to check her out she's amazing and you can see how quickly the scene changes from the from the rain to the church scenes so um, what has to happen well we have to have a drain system a very a big big drain system that can take all of the water that is coming towards the stage floor uh, store it on a tank and uh, pump it all the way up so it can circle around and around and around so that's a very uh, nice piece of scenery and design. So uh, after talking a little bit about uh, design with th these two examples, let's talk about uh, theater consultants and what is a theater consultant? Well, um, basically um, theater consultants are the ones that uh, provide specialized advice, guidance and expertise in the planning design and implementation of theatrical facilities or performance spaces. It's basically the people that um, architects, clients, developers hire to get advice and guidance in the uh, design process of a performance space. So uh, instead of going into uh, depths and, and uh, very complicated definitions about what theater consultants do, um, I can sort of um, make it short by telling you that we ask lots of questions. We ask questions to the client, to the performers, to the to the people that are financing the projects and all of that. So um, what we try to do generally is to um, understand the main purpose of the building. So what will, uh, it's gonna be an opera theater, it's gonna be a, a drama theater, a dance theater, it's gonna be uh, for uh, musical uh, events, it's gonna be a big uh, performance venue. Uh, We're gonna be the primary users Maybe this is going to be a high school theater. So we're uh, talking about uh, young people or we're talking about uh, an auditorium for uh, conferences and things like that. So we have to understand what uh, kinds of people are going to be attending. Uh, we need to identify the potential friction points and we're gonna talk about this a little bit later uh, that the site or the general conditions uh, may present. We need to understand the regulations and codes that apply to our building. That means that uh, if we're working in the United States, every state has a different code for these kinds of spaces. And if we are working all over the world, well, every uh, legislation is different. So we have to understand those things. And who's going to review the project based on those codes? What are the program requirements? What is, um, what is needed on the theater? Um, what is the budget? Because that will det determine the amount of uh, equipment and technical uh, uh, machinery we're able to put into the uh, performance venue. And um, especially the last one, the scope of work. What are we doing? Are we doing seating? Are we doing rigging? Are we doing drapery? Are we uh, just consulting on the general program? What is the idea of our work so we don't uh, move past it or uh, get shorthanded? So these are the, the main uh, like keywords of what a theater consultant uh, does uh, on a regular basis. Um, I Sorry to cut you off, my bro, but actually there's a question in the chat that yep. is from Arda, and she says, a theater consultant has to be an architect or can it, study, or can it be studied uh, without having an architectural degree? 
Well, that's a very, very good question. Um, well, uh, currently I'm working with a lot of professionals and they are all great and wonderful. And there are very few architects actually. Uh, usually theater consultants are people that have um, a very uh, long career in the theater, working on productions as light, sound, and video designers and, and technicians that then go uh, on to become theater consultants for architects. So um, I, I, I feel that uh, as architects, we are able to do that job and we're able to understand it and to uh, perform it in a very good uh, manner. But there's also the need of people that have worked on the theater, that have been on a catwalk uh, or on stage as a performer to be able to understand the needs uh, that may uh, come. And, and so it's important a balance of both things. I think architects are able to do it. I think many professionals are able to do it. But the most important thing is that you um, have a, a general knowledge of how a theater uh, works and how uh, performance arts um, work in order to have a, a very good um, performance, I guess. Great, man. Thank you. Well, Marga, if you want to leave us, go pursue your career, theater career. Now you know. Hmm? Yeah, definitely. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Anyone has any other questions? Uh, this is a great moment to have a question. So we're like talking, but if you don't, um, Alvaro, you, you can continue with your, yeah. your lesson. No worries. No questions, I can continue. All right, um, the idea um, for um, for the consulting, for the theater consultants is to get them as soon as possible on the design process, because there are a lot of things that happen um, beforehand that sometimes leave us uh, a little bit a constraint on the amount of, of solutions that we can provide, uh, especially for the site selection. Um, it's very important to know where to place your building. Uh, there's a, here over here on this slide, we see a couple of ideas that can help on the decision making process uh, for the for a, for a purchasing of a, of a lot or a, or a place to, to put the, the theater. The first one is the impact of our urban regeneration and local economy. What is going to do the theater is going to provide uh, what kind of amenities along the way? Uh, are we close to uh, food? Are we close to a park? Are we close to public facilities that will make uh, the theater a work like on a synergy, like a nice synergy between those spaces? Um, do we have an ideal travel plan to get in and out of the theater? Are we close to public transportation? Are we going to put a parking lot on the on the theater, or is it, or is there a parking lot close by, or are we providing access to alternative modes of transportation, like uh, like bicycles or uh, going on foot or or things like that? That's also very important. Um, is the Deliberately to the venue. Remember, this is a working theater, so uh, things will be loading and unloading from the building. So we need to have uh, trucks uh, on in the way. So we have to have a very nice street in order to do that, and in order for not to to um, to start bothering the neighbors. That's a very important part. Uh, visibility. Are we going to make an icon of this uh, uh, of this building? Are we going to make a a very uh, important part of the of the city's uh, view. The acoustic environment, this works on both sides. Um, we don't want any of the noise from the street to uh, filter in into the theater, but we also don't want, especially on big uh, performance venues, we don't want any noise to go out and annoy the neighborhood as well. So those things work, uh, that thing works on both sides. Uh, then audience catchment area, are we close to, to important uh, places where people are passing by or um, can come uh, to, the, to the theater? And if we want additional income, income streams, uh, such as maybe a coffee shop, maybe a gift shop, maybe some offices, some rehearsal spaces that we want to rent, what is the theater providing additional to the actual performance spaces. So those are things that we we can sort of uh, start to understand and to ask questions to see if uh, any of this makes sense. Um, I have a, uh, an example for this as well. Uh, this is the National Theatre Complex in London. This is uh, right by the banks of the river. So um, 
this is a, I call it a complex because this is actually three theaters in one. So the three uh, big rooms are the Dorfman Theater, uh, which uh, well has uh, lovely galleries and this is a more of a, of a small space, much more intimate. We have the Little Tongue Theater we ha uh, that has a balcony and uh, the main auditorium. Uh, this a little bit bigger. And then we have the Olivia Theater. This is where we saw previously the Crucible. Um, so the the um, the Olivia Theater is around 1,100 uh, seats uh, in this sort of uh, fan, open fan uh, disposition or layout. Um, so it's a very um, interesting space as well. It's not a very traditional um, uh, theater, but it's very, it's the most used one and it's very big. Additional to the three spaces that uh, the three for performance spaces, we have uh, lots of um, outdoor spaces that we are able to transform and to create um, other performance spaces or fairs or marketplace or things like that. We also have uh, bookshops. We also have office spaces. Um, on this complex, we also have workshops. We also have um, archive uh, facilities. And the idea of those three theaters is that they all uh, sort of share a back of house space. So they all share the dressing room complex. They will share the workshops and it, it makes it for a very efficient way of, of working. Those are three different theaters that work as a single uh, unit when they are needed to. Um, so on the theater design, when we start uh, our consultation process, um, we can start understanding or uh, identifying friction points. So that's every element that could potentially be difficult or complicate the functions of a performance venue. So we want people to get here and we want performers to choose our building instead of others. So we need to identify the, possi the possible um, problems that they, they may encounter. So, um, Basic for the audience, uh, do we have a parking lot close by? Does the neighborhood provide the safe and varied atmosphere before and after the show? Can I go and have a drink before or is there places to go after? Um, are there any alternative means of transportation to get to the venue or do I have to be in traffic for a couple of hours to get there? So basically what we ask the audience is, or we ask ourselves about the audience is, what is keeping them from coming to the theater? So that's the main question. Then on the technical uh, for the for the cast and crew, uh, does the building provide ease of loading and unloading for equipment and materials, or is it very difficult? Is it a, a theater on a second floor that we need a, a lift to move scenery in and out? Uh, what kind of creative possibilities does this, does the space provide the artist? Is it um, complete enough with all of the elements and, and technical facilities to to accommodate a certain show? Um, is it uh, comfortable to use, et cetera? Uh, and are there uh, are the additional commodities of the theater enough for the cast and crew? Do we have a green room? Do we have, uh, uh, I don't know, a coffee shop or um, a nice uh, rehearsal space? So what we ask uh, ourselves about the performers and the crew is that, um, is the venue comfortable for performers and technicians? Because if it's if it's not, it's gonna they're gonna go to another theater, so we're gonna lose that uh, booking. Um, before this part, uh, any questions? I can make a quick stop here. No. No questions on the chat, at least. I have a question, Eduardo. Um, sure. Earlier, you showed us like this theater that had like all the the seats, like this um inclination you know that's related uh with the size of the theater like if it's a smaller one uh the seats can be like um in the same uh distance from the from the play yeah I if, uh, if i made myself clear <laughs> yeah i think you're you're talking a little bit about the sidelines and how to design mm -hmm. the seats i'm going to talk about that in a little while so uh Amazing. if i if i answer the question uh, let me know and if i oh. don't ask me again and, and we can come back to that uh point right. exactly uh, yep. perfect thanks no worries so um yeah um uh, Theater components. So we have the front of house elements. That's everything that the that the audience uses. 
box office bathrooms uh the gathering spaces at the back the the circulation corridors to get in and out of the theater everything that the audience and the public uses then we have the back of house elements those that's everything that is on the back of the of the theater every production uh, storage equipment storage uh, workshops rehearsal rooms dressing rooms everything that the performance and the cast uses control booths every, all, of, all of those things but uh, mainly we're gonna um concentrate on the auditorium and stage today. So uh, maybe on a, on a better session point two, we can talk about those other elements, but right now let's talk about the theater itself. So uh, let's start with the seating to get to, to Kami's question. Uh, so uh, first of all, we have to identify the typology of the theater, right? So uh, the opera house, for example, uh, has lots of room on the wings. The, the wings are the spaces on the sides of the stage and lots of space on the back because of the design of the scenery in an opera. So we have those big epic pieces that have to move in and out of the of the stage. So we need lots of room on the sides and on the back to store those things. Also, uh, opera houses usually have uh, like a repertoire system. So they have a couple of plays uh, at the same time. So they they need to to be able to store one thing while they use another and then put it back and, and those sort of, of combinations. So the, the main part of, a, of an opera building is, um, is that the, how big that uh, back of house can uh, become. Do any of our uh, South American audience know what theater is this? For yeah, an extra Teatro credit? Colón. Yes, that's the Teatro Colón. Uh, both um, the uh, Solis Theater in uh, Montevideo and Teatro Colón, those are both opera theaters. So if you have the chance to go there, you'll be able to see the big dimensions and proportions of that, of the, those sort of spaces. Um, then we have concert halls. Concert halls may take many, many different shapes. Uh, right now, let's talk about these two because those are very different. The shoebox and the concert, uh, the shoebox and the vineyard. Shoebox is a very square type of, of space um, with, as you, as you know, the, the concert hall, it's all the way around. Audience go all the way around, even on the back of the, uh, sometimes the back of the, of the um, orchestra. Um, other times it's just the chorus or things like that. But basically the shoebox is a very straightforward uh, shape. But then the vineyard, and this is a very um, uh, famous building. This is the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. This is by Frank Gehry, like a very crazy architecture on the outside. But it's also a very interesting vineyard um, concept uh, concert hall. So we, we have several balconies going all the way around, uh, having a, a very interesting uh, composition on the seating as well. We have recital rooms. The basic thing about the, the, the recital rooms, this is the Carnegie Hall. That's one of the most famous in the world. Um, is the, the shape on the back of the stage that helps uh, this like an acoustic um, shell that just projects sound outwards. And is a very um, interesting part of, of the recital rooms uh, design that they usually have that sort of small cave where the, the orchestra or the or the philharmonic or the chorus sits and projects sound outwards so it's very uh, nice as well. Dance theaters, uh, they usually take this uh, configuration. Basically what we want on a dance theater is to look at the feet of the dancers. So we want to see from the feet all the way up. So this is a, a very common configuration. So we're able to see everything um, um, that's also because sometimes uh, dance theaters also uh, double as a dance studio. So they usually have a retractable seating and they're able to just move everything out of the way and have the dance classes and all of that for uh, day to day. And they, they bring everything together and uh, create the performance spaces as well. Drama theaters can take all of these configurations. The square is the theater. So we have an arena, we have an aisle, we have a three uh, thrust stage, um, uh, all of these kinds of, of seating arrangements. And then we can have an, uh, a, black, a black box uh, environment we, when we don't have anything and people just move around in the, 
in the space and, and it's a more immersive experience on that way. On drama theaters, I can uh, show you this one. That's the Epidaurus uh, stage. Well, that's a very old, old theater, but it's still working uh, with a very nice uh, and, and proven uh, acoustic environment. So people are talking. That's almost 13 to 1400 uh, people can go in there. So it's a very, very big um, uh, theater. And so it's a, a little bit of, of uh, ancient history for for everybody, and and that's the the way theaters were were made, with a um also with the with the help of the topography. So it's very nice to have it over there. Then another example I bring you is La Badia. This is in Madrid. This is uh, an old uh, church that they uh, refurbished and created the theater. So also lots of possibilities, architectural possibilities, because architectural elements from the cathedral or the, the church are uh, main, maintained, but um, they also have a, a couple of the technical facilities for a theater. So it's very interesting uh, room as well. And then we have entertainment venues uh, like this, the big O2 arena in London. So that's uh, huge. It's uh, 30, uh, 30, 40,000 people sitting plus uh, everything that we have on the center of the stage. Um, this kind of places are very um, flexible because we can move the, the stage around. We can put it on the center on one side, on two sides. We can do crazy things. And the idea is that the, the technical aspects of the building uh, can be arranged and rearranged to accommodate to all of those uh, possible layouts. This is uh, for our friends in Brazil. This is uh, Alina Bobardi Theater, uh, a very interesting space as well. Um, this is uh, a, a custom-made theater for um, uh, Oficina uh, Theater Group. So it's a very interesting uh, proposal that they're doing with these uh, elements over here where people can uh, stand and look at the performance and they do crazy, crazy things. They also have this huge window over here. This is sort of the theater that breaks every theater rule possible, but it's very nice to, to see it and to and to know that even on these conditions um, and, and uh, performers can do great things as well. So it's very, very interesting as well. Um, then I want to show you the, um, the, this performance center in Dallas, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, platforms, rigging and things like that. Uh, but this is a theater that is able to turn, uh, sort of this thrust, uh, composition into a flat stage, and then it can become two theaters if they, if they want, but that's all, um, uh, mechanically run platforms that go up and down that kind of store uh, seats and and re and do different layouts on the on the theater also the galleries on the sides uh, go up uh, and down so they're able to uh, basically do a flat uh, floor and that's very interesting and that's very expensive as well i'm showing you expensive uh, solutions but they're very nice solutions. And also the, the four sides of that theater is uh, windows, glass windows that can be uh, shut down with uh, blackout curtains. But uh, it's also very interesting how you can create uh, this sort of space uh, where there was once a theater. So it's a very interesting and expensive solution, but there you go. Um, talking about sidelines uh, right now about uh, the seating, uh, there are a couple of things that we have to take into account. Uh, basically, uh, we need to see at least the top of um, of the of the stage if it's a raised stage. So we we need to see this point. So what we try to do is um, we try to study that thing by uh, drawing lines from that place all the way to the eyesight of all the people on a base, uh, sometimes on this, on a center line section. So we make a section of the theater and we start to draw lines from the eye of uh, every row all the way to there. And we start to play with vertical distance and horizontal distance. So if we are going, if we're moving on a horizontal distance, we have to move on a vertical uh, distance as well. Um, or vice versa, we can do the other thing around. We also have to control the uh, sidelines on the uh, follow spot booths as well. 
that's where uh, the operator of the flow spot uh, is, and on the control room as well. Control room operators have to have a great visibility of the stage and a great visibility sometimes of the top of the stage where there are lights and uh, technical elements and, and equipment. So they have to have like that open view as well. Um, and things change on every section of the theater. And on this example I have for you, we don't have a balcony, but also on the balcony, we have to understand the sidelines of those people. So if we don't have a staggered seating, that means that we will have always a head in front of us. Uh, that means that uh, we need to uh, make the calculations of the sideline in order for the person on the back row to be able to look just past that head. If we have an, a staggered seating, that means that we are, we're gonna see through two heads. That's so we're staggering, one, one is here and the other ones are on each side. So we have to make the calculations to move past the head of this one, but we have to look on top of the head of the one, uh, of the one two rows uh, ahead. So that's the, the idea. So on the one that we have the an unstaggered seating, we need to look uh, past the, the head of the one right in front of us. And on the staggered seating, we need to see two rows bef uh, before ours. So that's the idea. And that's what we do. We just draw lines all day long in order for them to start uh, hitting that a uh, very nice spot on the top on the on the top of the race stage. Uh, additional elements that we also try to design on the on the seating part uh, cross aisles. That way we can go from one side to uh, to another. Uh, the control booth position and photos booth booth position. Uh, sign, sound, and light locks. Those are that uh, small room that we end before we enter the the theater where we can open doors and close them and then open the doors on the theater and close them. That way, uh, no light and no sound will spill in and out of the room. And um, that's a, a, a design solution, the VOMS, that's where we are when we are coming through, um, when they're seating on top of us and we're coming through that seating to a, a cross aisle or to a, a corridor or something like that. Design considerations, um, seats per row, affect the uh, width of those rows, the aisles that serve those rows as well, the width of the cross aisles and the rows, everything that has to do with egress and emergency evacuation has to be taken into account, the distances, ADA spaces and accessibility, we need to, to bring in and out uh, wheelchairs to a comfortable position that makes them part of the whole experience. Um, we need to understand uh, the manufacturer the manufacturer's uh, conditions and um, abilities to do what whatever we are planning to do. Uh, head clearances on the balconies and galleries. This means that when people stand at the very top of a gallery, they don't uh, hit their heads on the roof, basically. Um, access to the stage, the light and sound locks, and the control and projection booth sidelines as well. Let me talk a little bit about rigging as well. We have three types of rigging, dead hung. That means that we are just hanging things from the from the ceiling. Counterweight, those are uh, systems that allow us to counter the weight of an element of a scenic element uh, and move it easily with uh, our own hands. And then we have the motorized systems that are uh, basically uh, uh, hydro hydraulic or or otherwise and they help us move big things in a more uh, organized thing uh, those um, elements are concentrated on the fly tower on usually on the catwalks so those are the two places where, where we usually see um, this kinds of equipment this is the fly tower over here that's what we see when we look up the stage and these are catwalks where we are able to uh, hang uh, lights, sound, and maybe scene elements, scenery elements, if we need to. This is a diagram of the basic counterweight system. Uh, so this is the baton. This is where we hang uh, scenery, curtains, drapery, whatever we need to. Uh, so we measure the weight of whatever we have on the baton, and we counterweight it with uh, weights here in the arbor. The arbor is this thing, is this element over here where we put different um, amounts of weights and we're able to uh, pull everything up and down in a very easy way. But we also have, um, oh, I'm sorry, and uh, grid systems, we have two. Uh, 
uh, this is a very basic grid system. And then we have a tension grid system when we are basically doing a floor on the top of the auditorium where we can hang lights and we can hang uh, everything without any issues. And it's very safe and very nice. So people can walk on that grid and make any adjustments to lights and stuff like that. So this is a, a tension grid system is very popular, uh, especially on, on black box theaters. It's very used. And uh, what I want to show you are the, um, this kinds of uh, motorized batten systems. Uh, those ropes, those lines that you see over here go all the way to the top of the fly tower. And we're able to control them by using a, a control panel and they are very nice, also very expensive. But well, these are made by Tate, that's a manufacturer of these kinds of systems. But you're able to control and program all of this individually, collectively and make uh, changes in a very seamless way. Um, so um, let me show you a little bit more. So you're able to move them in very uh, interesting uh, ways just because they are programmed by the computer. Uh, another element is the platforming. That's uh, when we make elevated surfaces uh, with various functions and operations as well. Uh, the first one, and this is a very um, uh, basic one, is the rake stage. That means um, the, that the floor is sloped towards the audience. That's for acoustic and visual reasons. Sometimes theaters do have that this kind of, of uh, rake stage already on the floor of the stage. Sometimes we can build it on top as well. Um, this brings the concept of um, uh, upstage and downstage. So when we're talking about upstage is uh, on the back of the, of the stage and downstage on the very edge of that same stage. Uh, other elements, orchestra platforms that are able to go up and down so we can make a nice uh, proscenium space when it's up and then we can accommodate a full orchestra uh, when it's down. So we have a, a nice pit. And these kinds of elements are uh, also nice uh, and we need to budget for those things as well because sometimes we can even put seating on those uh, orchestra pits uh, platforms. That's Cirque du Soleil. This is a very interesting stage as well. It can go from a fully horizontal position to a vertical uh, position. That kind of stage also has uh, mapping possibilities and uh, performance can go in and out of that because it's like a, like a cookie. So we have the top and we have a bottom and people can be in between those two spaces. This is of a show called Ka. You can check it out if you want to. It's very interesting and it's a very technically advanced uh, show. That's a turntable. Also uh, put in the theater. So we have uh, several turntables that move around. You can make this sort of nice uh, compositions if you like to. That's a combination of both uh, moving platforms and turntables. In this case, this show uh, from the National Theater is everything is inside of this box. This glass box also turns around and they can change every platform on that box and make uh, scene changes. So that goes from, uh, I don't know, the, the winter uh, set into an interior set into whatever you need to. And that's uh, also a combination of both, both uh, platforming and um, turntables. Uh, basic ideas of audio and video that we need to take into account. Um, we, uh, the goal is to enhance the, the experience uh, using audio and video uh, elements. When we're talking especially about uh, audio, we need that this, we uh, are looking at the spoken, singing, music, everything has a clear sound. We don't like an echo on the theater, so we are working towards um, taking that out and or uh, diminishing it as much as possible. Um, when we design the, the sound system, the idea is to deliver a clear and balanced audio, audio throughout the auditorium. So we were gonna have big uh, main speakers, that's the ones you usually see, but then we have uh, uh, smaller filler um, speakers that will take the sound all the way to the back, 
all the way to the sides and everybody must have the same experience even though they paid uh, a little bit less for their seat. Um, acoustic treatments, uh, the idea is to break uh, flat surfaces in architecture. So uh, we try to uh, talk with the architects as much as possible to uh, get that from the, from the get-go, from the design of the building. But if we are not able to do that, we can use additional um, paneling, baffles, and we can work on the design of the ceiling and the walls of that auditorium in order to make it much more uh, acoustic. Um, we, what we try to do is to control reverberation and ensure the clarity of the word. Considerations for architects, room sizes and primary use. So if we are making a very wide uh, uh, room or a very deep room, we have to take in that into consideration. The primary use, is it for music? Is it for drama? Is it for dance? What are we using the room for? Um, the general shape and special spatial, spatial configuration. So uh, if we are putting uh, balconies and galleries and pits, that usually changes the acoustic on a room. Um, and the materials we're using, sound locks are very important and avoid or diminish the background noises such as uh, the HVAC systems that can be turned on and off in the middle of a performance and bother everybody with the, with the hissing sound. Then we have video elements, projection, video, additional display, LED screens, things like that. Um, everything that we can do as well to enhance the performance and uh, to make nice effects as well. We usually uh, uh, also um, make recommendations on the stage monitoring. That way we can have a constant view of the stage and we can have TVs on the on the control rooms and on the dressing rooms where people can see what's happening on stage and keep that uh, monitor. We also um, can use recording and broadcasting uh, equipment and, and to, to record uh, a performance or to live broadcast a performance as well. And the intercom and communication system between uh, the crew and the booth and the stage manager. So everything has to go through um, audio racks that, con that um, communicate with the whole building and everybody can talk in the middle of a presentation without screaming. My name. This is a, a, an example of a great use of a video design. This is the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. Uh, so we have video mapping, we have uh, LED screens, and we have additional uh, uh, audiovisual elements that complete the design for this uh, performance. So this is very, very interesting use of all those, all of those elements. And we also have um, for immersive experiences, uh, audio and uh, video with uh, uh, sensors and movement um, uh, elements that can help you or help the 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 person experiencing the the space to interact with the with the video and the projection so it's very interesting also to see these kinds of elements this is very uh, used also on i've seen it used in dance performances where the dancer is uh downstage and on the back you can see the the projection sort of moving around with the uh, performance so it's very nice and interesting and this is uh Another project, uh, a very interesting way, because this is uh, it's not a turning the volume down. Uh, this is not a performance space. This is a commercial uh, uh, project, and uh, they're able to create an environment uh, using lights, losing, using sound uh, projections, and um, you can see the sort of the environment change uh, along the day. Um, this is a, a night uh, view. Then you have a daylight view and everything also has different um, ways of of sort of interacting with the people uh, so there's rigging on the on that those elements as well as video and sound elements that come together with the with the design so to finish up um, I think these are the things that uh, you have to know I like have, have to know, even though I just scraped the surface on many, many different things and and probably have you more confused than, than clarified, but 
it's okay. It's part of the of the job. So uh, we must know the material. We need to know the play. We need to know the client. We need to know the the audience. We need to understand what are the needs of those um, of those people and try to solve them as best as we can. We have to ask questions because this is what we do. We need to um, when we don't understand something, we need to ask. We need to consult. We need to um, ask the people that know much more than us and and that will make us much uh, smarter. Uh, understand the user uh, in every possible way. Uh, define and develop the functions. Don't give anything for granted. Um, if the if this is the way that people have told you to create a lobby or a dressing room or a bathroom, sort of question that thing and, and turn it around and make it better by uh, just developing that set, that um, kind of design. Research and investigate thoroughly. That means uh, use the internet. Uh, I've, I've showed you a couple of things, but there are much, much more and they're uh, available to everybody. And uh, finally, let the design be uh, of service to the artist and the audience, because that's the, ba the basics for us. As designers, we have to put our effort to uh, sort of understand those two uh, people, artists and audiences, and make the best out of the situation they present. There are a couple of resources that I would like to share with you. Um, the American Theater Wing has a nice YouTube uh, uh, page, National Theater as well. Then you can see uh, the abstract episode about S. Devlin. She's amazing. The tech, TED Talk about David Corins uh, is very good as well. Uh, you can uh, go to the American Society of Theater Consultants and the Chicago Fly House Incorporations for Rigging Basics. Uh, our uh, Better Pros client of your design is a consultant firm uh, for uh, theater. So if you have any clients that need any help, uh, Apiro is there to help as well. And me, I, if I don't know, I will help you look and we can learn together as well. Um, and a bonus track. Uh, I hope that uh, Santi will help me after this. We're starting the Revit 101 uh, course for beginners to have uh, the basics of 3D modeling and maybe a couple of things that we can learn together. So uh, we're gonna start on that soon and uh, Santi will give you more information when the time comes. So thank you everybody, that's it. Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you all for attending. You can. Uh, ask any questions and we will make sure to get the answer to you as fast as we can. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Hope you, the next time you go to a theater, you'll see how much work it's put onto it before you can go. Santi? You know, there's not much I can say actually. So I would just like to thank everyone. See you in the next one. Wait for all the content that we're going to be launching. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably it's going to be some exclusive content, exclusive like resource or links for you guys to download furthermore. But thank you all for coming. I hope you really enjoyed it as much as I did. I really love theater. So uh, thank you, everyone. Sophie, you want to say something? Our boss, our boss's boss. We love you, Alvaro. We love you. This was amazing. It was amazing, Alvaro. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. You're very well. If anybody has any questions, uh, please, uh, right now or later, also, no worries. <laughs>